Oh. <laughs> oh, that doesn't get old. All right, so today I'm gonna to sharpen a Tsuchihiki. This is a Saji that's, a, it's a demo Saji that I've been using in my home now for I would say on and off for a good six months or so. A lot of folks have been asking about how to sharpen a Tsuchihiki. And you know, for those who aren't familiar with the term, it's essentially a Japanese slicer. So if you have a, you know, any sort of Western knife that is a slicer profile, that's essentially what this knife is. And then in terms of equipment, obviously this is just my setup here. You guys use whatever you guys have at your disposal. Don't worry about picking up expensive equipment. Um, this is my personal sharpening setup that I use for my knives in my home. So I've got my 9 Pro 800, 3000. This is the Ricky edition. And then I've got my Whetstone holder and then the 9 bridge and then a water bin. And so what I'm gonna do also is because this is a slicer, I'm gonna put it onto the 8000 Kitayama, which is a very good stone. It's one of my top picks for the 8000 grit range. Um, so I don't really go onto the 8000 grit stones for my chef knives and my Kyoto's, but because this is a slicer, it's appropriate for me to go onto the 8000 grit whetstone. So I'll put this aside and this will be at the very end before we go into the straw. Okay, so just like last time, I'm gonna go through the sharpening motions, show you exactly what I did. So I'll do the sharpening motion first and then kind of give you guys kind of a playback of what happened. Uh, I don't wanna talk during the sharpening. I don't wanna talk over the whetstone noise. Um, so you guys can hear exactly what's happening on the whetstone. And so after I do one pass, I'll kind of, kind of reiterate what just happened and then we'll go through the entire sharpening session that way. Okay, so enjoy. Oh, in case you guys are wondering why the wall <laughs> is completely empty other than a few of my... Uh, uh, these are knives, actually are prototypes of knives that I've designed and a couple of knives that don't have boxes. But basically, if you guys haven't heard, I am moving to a dedicated filming studio and production studio for perfection. And all of the knives, um, with the exception of a few, are going to be on auction. I'm auctioning pretty much all of my knives off for a dollar starting price with no reserve. So if you guys are curious about that, watch last week's video or I'll post a link in the video description to where you can find the knives for auction. These are the rusty razors that I use to clean all my wet stones with. Uh, this one here is about three years old and I simply got the stone wet, got the rusty razor wet and cleaned the surface of the whetstone from last week's sharpening session. Now I will get started on the sharpening. That chair was banging against the table legs. Okay. Okay, so um, what I've been doing is I'm going, um, these are what we call passes. So when I go from the tip of the knife to the heel in the push and pull motion, it's called a pass. And I did roughly three passes, I think, on this knife, on this bright side. And I've got a really, really fine micro burr from the tip all the way down to the heel. And this knife here, if you look at the profile, it's very straight. You know, Tsujihikis and slicers have relatively very straight profiles. So for this knife, the push and pull method is the most effective way. But also keep in mind, when you are doing the push and pull, it is a very aggressive stroke. So you don't wanna spend more than three or four strokes in one section of the knife. That's why I'm actually going through the tip to the heel in just a very few strokes. So I go two to three strokes, two to three strokes, and I go down the cutting edge that way. 
And uh, that's really all I do. I don't do the crescent method for this knife. Doing the crescent method, what's gonna happen is you actually will skip a good chunk of the middle of the knife because of the way the stroke works. So for me, the push and pull is the preferred way, at least for me when it comes to knives of this profile. I've just finished three passes on the right side of the knife and uh, we've got a really nice fine micro burr. So I'm gonna flip the knife around or turn the knife around. I'm gonna flip my stone and start on the left side of the knife. Okay, so that was pass number one. And you guys notice when I got through the halfway center of the knife, I turned my knife with every stroke. So by the time I reach the three quarters of the knife, three quarters down, the knife is basically completely horizontal to the whetstone. And the reason I do that is because if you don't, you can grind the left side of your ferrule or bolster, depending on what knife you're using. You don't want that. It messes up the knife. It messes up the aesthetics. And so, um, and the key thing is don't do an abrupt. Now I have seen people go from here and I'll show you what that, what I mean real quickly. Okay. That motion right there where you do a kind of 45 degree entry into the knife and then you stop and then you do a perpendicular motion. That is okay. But over time you may, you may see either a, a round spot or a slight hill on your knife, uh, right, be, right where that transition is. And so the best way to sharpen this particular profile is you wanna go in a nice smooth motion all the way to the end, the heel of the knife. So again, that's just my suggestion. Uh, it sounds more complicated than it really is. So just watch me, it's a very smooth transition and um, you know, with a little bit of practice and the key thing is not applying a lot of pressure on the knife as you are transitioning, or really just during any sort of sharpening process. So that's pass number one. Let's go pass number two. By three passes, I believe we can move on to the next stone or move to the next step. Okay, so also um, one thing to note, a lot of folks ask me how I work my tip or how do I sharpen my tip on my knives uh, during the sharpening. So for me, what I like to do most when it comes to sharpening is I like to take the tip and I have my point of entry, the angle of entry, which is in this case about 45 degrees. And I typically will go along the outer edges of the whetstone. Okay, then I go to the rest of the body of the knife. Now the reason I use the edges of the stone is because I don't want the stone to develop a flat spot or a groove right in the center. So using the edges of the stone really helps the stone wear more evenly. And for some people who are really keen, you guys saw me twist or turn the stone. Um, I do that out of habit because it helps me wear the stone down a little bit more evenly as well. You don't have to do it, it's just something I do. For those who've been with me for a few years now, you guys know that I'm a short track speed skater before I became uh, a dad. <laughs> so um, that's how I sharpen my skates. I turn my stones basically with every pass. I'll go into more detail of that in the future. Not for this video though. Um, so that was pass, I believe that was pass number three at this point. And uh, we've got a really nice fine micro burr on this knife from tip to heel. So at this point, um, as I pointed out, a lot of folks will stop here and they'll grab a piece of wood and they will basically pull the cutting edge on the wood and remove the burr. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I prefer a method that I've shown in a previous 
tutorial, and basically all my tutorials show the same thing, is I don't go onto that at all. This is not this is not my preferred way of removing a burr. So the way I do it is I go back to the stone, the stone that I've just sharpened on, and I do what I call a counting down method. So I will count down from, let's say, 10 strokes on each side, down to eight strokes, down to six strokes, to four strokes, two strokes, and then one stroke. So I'll do it for you guys, and you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay, so that was 10 strokes, give or take a stroke. And uh, I'll go to the other side and do the same thing. So again, that was 10 strokes, give or take. <laughs> I don't count really well. From here, then I go down to eight strokes. And the reason you're doing it this way or the reason I'm doing it this way is because your, your burr, you have your knife's cutting edge and when you sharpen, you have a burr that develops either on the left side or the right side. And if you were to remove that burr on the piece of wood, you would, for the most part, would remove most of it or you would shorten it. Um, but there still would be a burr that's sticking to one side or the other. By doing it this way on the whetstone, you actually are taking that burr and instead of just pulling off an edge and leaving a burr sticking to one side or the other, you're standing that burr completely straight on the apex. So by the time you get to one stroke per side, that burr is essentially not necessarily gone, but perfectly aligned in the center of the knife. And so that's how you get the crispiest edge you can on your knife. I'll go down to eight, uh, go down to six, and I'll go through the entire process. And then I'll stop at two and explain something really, really uh, important for me, at least in that step. Um, and also for those who are wondering, I'm implying no pressure on the knife. Uh, everything from the sharpening process to the deburring process, I'm not applying any pressure. And the reason why you don't want to apply any pressure is because when you apply pressure at the wrong spot, especially for those who are new to sharpening, and you apply pressure and let's say your finger, the, the counterbalance fingers are not in the center of the knife or in line with the whetstone and your fingers are up here and you apply any sort of pressure, maybe a half a pound, a pound, you actually will push that knife onto the edge of the whetstone and you will kill your edge. Okay, so that's why I always, always say don't apply any pressure, let the pressure or let the weight of the knife and your hands do the work for you and just trust that the stone will do its thing. Um, so that's my answer to those who are wondering how much pressure, how many pounds of pressure you should be putting onto your whetstone. Um, there are plenty of other tutorials I have seen that people say you put between four pounds and six pounds of pressure on your whetstone. I don't really go by that. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with trying to apply a constant pressure to the whetstone. I just find that the risk outweighs the benefit for most people, especially those who are starting out. That was eight on each side. So that was six. 
Uh, and it also, in case you were wondering, it doesn't really matter if you go from heel to tip or from tip to heel, whatever you're most comfortable with, that is gonna be fine. So don't get caught up in the most minute details. It doesn't really affect the edge that much. Uh, you know, if you're trying to go from tip to heel and you know, go from tip to heel, which is fine, there's actually nothing wrong with going from tip to heel. But for a lot of people, going from tip to heel with your arm extended out this way, it's really difficult. So that's why I find it easier for most people to go from heel to tip when you're pulling towards you and then going from tip to heel when you're going away from you, okay? Okay, that was four. Okay, so now we're down to two. Okay, so I'm gonna stop right here. When I get down to two, I typically will go between two to three sets of two on each side because I'm really preparing the cutting edge or preparing the apex to stand really high up in the apex or on the apex. So I will go two sets to three sets of two pulls. Okay, so now we're down to one stroke per side. And again, when it comes to the single stroke, there's no science behind it. You can stop at six, you can stop at two, you can stop at one, whatever you wanna do. I typically just go by feel and by sound. When I hear that there is no change in pitch between the first stroke and then the sixth stroke, then I can stop. Um, so right now I think we are good. That was about four to five strokes, uh, four to five pairs of strokes. And so, okay, so from here we move on to the next stone. Uh, in this case, it's the 3000 grit. And the stone is nice and clean. Okay, we're good. Okay, so I will clean my knife off really quickly here. Pull off the debris from the last whetstone. And uh just for kicks. Let's see, where is, oh. Okay, so it's nice and clean. The edge is definitely nice and clean. And uh, we're gonna clean it up some more. Okay, so this is a very crucial step, in my opinion. Uh, in most tutorials that I've seen, pretty much 100% of the tutorials I've seen, people go back to the push and pull method when you're moving up to the whetstones. So when you move up to the 3000, 8000, almost pretty much every single tutorial I've seen will say, or they will show you going back to the entire polishing session all over again, developing a burr, and then going through the entire process that way. Um, I don't do it that way. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. If that's how people wanna do it, it's fine. I basically go to the one stroke method all the way to through the end of the last whetstone. So from here, I go one stroke at a time, one side at a time, until I get to my last stone. And here's how I do it. One stroke. One stroke. 
And generally, I'll do this about a dozen times or so. So I'm not exactly sure <laughs> if that was 12 or not, but this is what I do. So this is a really simple test to do for myself is I clean the stone off. Okay, make sure it's nice and clean. That's, those are cops, those are cop cars. Oh man. They're getting pretty close. <laughs> there, okay, either that had to have been like 10 cop cars going by because that was a good two to three minutes of just the same siren, siren sounds. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Anyway. Okay. Back to the, back to the sharpening uh, or polishing. Okay. So I've just cleaned my stone off. As you can see, it is perfectly clean. So now I basically do the exact same motions again. And I want to take a look at how the stone is actually loading up. So I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so you can see right here that the stone is not really loading up at all. The, the knife is really leaving a couple of traces here and there. Okay, and you can do it again to see for yourself. Okay, so you can see there is no marking on the stone at all. So this tells me that the apex, at this point, the burrs are standing completely straight up on the apex. So now I can move on to my next stone. Okay. So now, again, we continue exactly where we left off on the 3000 grit stone. Single stroke pulls. Okay, so the ink that's actually on the stone is causing more of the streaks than the actual knife itself. So at this point, I am essentially done with the wet stones. So let me show you the edge of the knife.
and people ask me why I blow into the knife. It's for good luck. <laughs> no, it's not. It's um, just to get the moisture, you know, that fog, that little hazy layer of fog away. And that helps your knife cut a little bit better, especially when you're just doing a really quick cut test. Oh, oh, that sounds nice. <laughs> Listen to this. Oh, that sounds better than a Ferrari going down the road. That sounds so nice. Okay, so for 99% of the people out there, that edge is like, it's perfect, it's done. You can do anything you want with that edge at this point. Um, I'm gonna go one step further. This is just for myself. Um, again, this is uh, something you don't have to do, but oh, this has got water on it. Uh, and also I'm doing this for my sake because I'm still, um, perfecting the stropping compounds that I'm developing. So I'm always testing uh, new batches that come in. And this is a new batch I've got. So we're gonna strop for uh, just a dozen strokes on each side. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, that doesn't get old. Oh, that is a perfect edge. <laughs> so nice. Uh, yeah, and uh, for those who are wondering, this is a R2 or SG2 core steel. Uh, I love this steel. And one of the best steels for stainless steel knives in the kitchen, at least. Um, let's do a really, really quick edge cut test on the PT50A. We'll put it right here. And for those who are curious, um, this knife out of the box, when I got it, it had an edge sharpness, I want to say, if I remember correctly, in the 170s. Um, I don't recall if it's like a low 170s or high 170s, but it was somewhere in the 170s, really sharp. Anything under 200 in my book, or really anything under 300 is acceptable on the PC50A, and anything under 200 is just, you know, it's... Uh, really, really sharp. So uh, we'll do it right here. Okay, so uh, can you guys see? Yeah, you know what I'll do? I will put it to 
to where you guys can actually see it yourselves. Um, how do I do this? Yeah. Yeah, never mind. I'll just do it here. And hopefully I won't mess up and uh, drop it into the water. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's try this again. Now I'll try to leave everything here and do this as fast as I can because it takes you know 30 seconds or so to load this this uh, wire here. I won't get people accusing me of switching out knives. Okay. So here we are, set to zero. And the way it w this works is it measures in grams how much weight it takes to cut this filament. So if you if I press here and I release, my finger just released at 250 grams. So that's how it works. We set this to zero. Now we do our cut. Two twenty-eight. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hmm. So let's try that again. Two twenty-eight is good. And I was hoping to achieve under 200, um, but that's a little bit more difficult when I'm talking at the same time <laughs> and sharpening. Um, but yeah, let's see what we got here. So 228, which is not bad. Did I clean the edge yet? Okay, let's clean the edge really quickly here. One eighty nine. <laughs> so, one eighty nine. Okay, so I guess my edge wasn't quite as clean as I thought. One eighty nine on three whetstones and a strop. That to me is very acceptable, um, or really more than acceptable. That's a really good edge. <laughs> so almost as sharp, or at least at the cutting edge, as the factory edge. Um, the guys over at Saji know what they're doing when it comes to sharpening, so I'm not surprised that I couldn't achieve their sharpness, at least just from what I got here. Um, I will post a video of my visit to Saji. I had a chance to meet Saji-san, and his workshop is just a really cool spot in Ichizen. And I don't know if you guys have been asking for that, uh, and I'll post it at some point. Um, but, you know, the sharpening process on a Tsuchihiki is... Very similar to a Gyoto, uh, but you just have to just be aware that because of the straighter profile, you're less likely to want to do any sort of browning motion on the whetstone. Any sort of a curved motion on the whetstone will risk you leaving a flat spot on this knife. Uh, and then another key point to remember, when you're going from whetstone to whetstone, don't restart the entire sharpening process of looking for the burr, sharpening the right side, feeling for the burr, going to the left side, feeling for the burr, and then deburring. Um, I go from whetstone to whetstone progressively and using one stroke at a time. And so that to me has given me the cleanest edge I've gotten on my knives. Um, so that's something I've just developed over the years of sharpening. Um, I used to do it the old way where I start the entire polishing process on the new whetstone all over again, go do the push and pull from tip to heel. Um, that works, it still works, there's nothing wrong with that. You still will develop a really nice clean edge. But to me, this saves a lot more time and also the edge I got tends to be a bit more consistent as well. Uh, you can see that even without the strop, the edge was extremely clean off of the 8000 grit Kitayama. Uh, but then the edge was even cleaner going onto the strop. So again, the strop is not absolutely necessary, it's just nice to have. For those who are curious about what I'm using, hopefully I'll remember to post links in the video description to everything I'm using. And um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments. Uh, if you guys want to see me sharpen other knife profiles, Again, leave it in the comments and I'll do my best to get those videos up. Uh, and for those who are curious, I am in the middle of a move. So I'm gonna take a couple of minutes and just kind of talk to you guys over, uh, or talk to you guys through what's happening. And before I go any further, I just wanna say thank you to every one of you, uh, especially my subscribers and my Patreon supporters who financially support me every single month. Without you guys being there for me, I would not be able to do what I'm doing now. So I just wanna say thank you from the bottom of my heart.
As I have mentioned in a couple of the previous videos, I am outgrowing the space here. So I have been looking at um, professional workspace outside of the home and I have found a couple, as a matter of fact, that I have put offers in. So I've actually, at this point, last week I put an offer in one location. Um, the owners were kind of iffy about what they want to do. And then this week I put in another offer and that offer has been accepted. So I'm going to give the first location a few a few more hours to get back to me about whether or not they want me in their space. And by the end of the day on Friday, if they don't hear from them, I'm gonna sign with a second space. And the new space is going to allow me to do a lot more uh, with my channel. And uh, it's just gonna give me more room to breathe. Uh, I have a lot of things I wanna set up, but everything's in boxes right now. And all my knives that I pulled off the wall, 90% um, of them will be up for auction, including this one at some point. Um, this one, again, was one of my demo pieces, and uh, I love this knife. But the reason why I'm going to just let this knife go is because I don't use this profile in my personal kitchen all that much. Um, I love this profile. I love, I love, love, love Tsuchihikis and Yanagi Buzz, but I don't use them enough to justify keeping them. So therefore, Patreon exclusive only is just my way of saying thank you to my Patreon supporters who have financially supported me through these years of me being on, on YouTube. Um, I don't put any reserve on them. I simply put it at a dollar starting price and I let my Patreon supporters decide how much they want to spend. Um, this system works better than the giveaway system where I select giveaways based on first come first serve or um, leave me a comment, whatever it is. Um, this way, the actual person who is bidding on these knives know exactly what they're getting. They know that they want this knife and they bid on it. So it allows them to actively participate in getting the knife that they want. And so to me, that's just much more, um, it's much more exciting. And it's just, uh, it's really fun to see what people do with these knives. Um, so it also surprises me what people are willing to pay or not willing to pay for certain knives. Um, so anyways, that's basically what I do with these knives. Um, all of my demos basically will go for sale uh, at some point. And I basically let the market dictate what they wanna pay for my knives. But before I send them off, I actually sharpen all of them. So just so you guys know, all of my demo knives are sharpened by me uh, before they go on auction. So they're fairly sharp and uh, they probably most of the time will be sharper than the factory edges um, with the exception of this one. This one, the factory edge was actually sharper than what I got, but it's still a very good edge. Well, I think that's it. Thank you for being here and I will catch you in the next video.